In estimating a population proportion, we continue our discussion of estimation, estimating a population proportion with the confidence interval. Recall that the purpose of a confidence interval is to use a sample proportion to construct an interval of values that we can be reasonably confident contains the true population proportion. <clears throat> the basic idea is summarized here. Okay, first, first bullet point, when we select a random sample from the population of interest, we expect the sample proportion to be a good estimate of the population proportion. But we also know that sample proportions vary, so we expect some error. Remember that the error here is due to chance. It's not due to a mistake that anyone made. So when we calculate population proportions um, or estimate them, yeah, we're, we're not making any mistakes. We're just knowing that random chance and different size samples and yeah, chance um, will affect the, the error. So we need some kind of um, some kind of confidence interval. For a given sample proportion, we will not know the amount of error. So we use the standard error as an estimate for the average amount of error we expect in sample proportions. Recall that the standard error is the expected standard deviation of sample proportions when we take many, many random samples. And the third, if a normal model is a good fit for the sampling distribution, then about 95% of sample proportions estimate the population proportion within two standard errors. We say that we are 95% confident that the following interval contains the population proportion. I think we saw this in the previous module, p hat plus or minus two standard errors. Another way to say that is p plus or minus the margin of error. And I think the, the formula that we had for standard errors was this square root formula you see here. That's why they replaced standard error in the first top line with the square root of p times one minus p all over n. So this, this would be your, the way you calculate um, your margin of error, or sorry, the population proportion. 95% confident that the following interval, yeah. So this, this is kind of what you would say when you calculate it. We would say that we are 95% confident that the interval below contains the population proportion. So it's somewhere within this interval. Um, the, with the plus, that'll give you a larger number at top, <clears throat> sorry, a higher value. And the bottom one will give you, the minus one will give you a bottom value. You may realize that the formula for the confidence interval is a bit odd since our goal in calculating a confidence interval is to estimate the population proportion P. Yet the formula requires that we know P. I think we, we pointed this out in the previous module. In the section, Introduction to Statistical Inference, we used an estimate for P from a previous study when calculating the confidence interval. This is not the usual way statisticians estimate the standard error, but it captured the main idea and allowed us to practice finding the, the, and interpreting confidence intervals. Now we will develop a different way to estimate standard error that is commonly used in statistical practice. Okay. Let's look at this example of community college students and gender. According to a 2010 report from the American Council on Education, females make up 57% of co the college population in the United States. Students in a statistical class at Tallahassee Community College want to determine the, the proportion of female students at that particular college. They select a random sample of 135 students at that college, Tallahassee Community College, and find that 72 are female, which is a sample proportion, 72 divided by 135 is 0. 0.533. So 53.3% of the students in the sample are female. What can they conclude about the, the proportion of females at the college and how confident can they be in their estimate? To answer these questions, we need to find a confidence interval. We'll check the conditions that make sure this is a normal model and we can actually use um, our formula for confidence intervals. We know that a confidence in interval comes from a normal model of the sampling distribution. So let's first make sure that a normal model is appropriate here. Recall the two conditions for using this normal model for sampling proportions. The sample must be random, which it sounds like it is from how they described it, the expected number of successes in the sample is n times p, the number of people in the sample multiplied by the population proportion, and the expected number of failures, which is just the opposite of that, the number of people multiplied by 1 minus p. They're both, they both better be greater than or equal to 10, or else we can't use a, a normal model. In symbols, this is n multiplied by p greater than or equal to 10, and also n multiplied by 1 minus p should be greater than or equal to 10. Recall that success doesn't mean good and failure doesn't mean bad. 
the success is just what we are counting. So in this in the case, this case, we're interested in how many are female. That would be counted as a success. Um, but if we were interested in what proportion is male, then the number of males would be the success. So it's, yeah, like they said, it doesn't mean good or bad. It's just whatever you're interested in counting is what you're going to say is success. And the opposite is failure, even though those don't really, those words don't really count or they don't make sense here. When we try to check these conditions, we have a problem. We do not know P, the population proportion. In the previous modules we did, but now we're focusing on what if we don't know P? In fact, P is what we're trying to estimate. So we cannot determine the expected number of successes and failures. The solution to this problem is to adjust these conditions. Advanced theory tells us that if the actual number of successes and failures in the sample are greater than or equal to 10, then a normal model is still a good fit. This sample contains 72 successes or female students and 63 failures or male students. So keep in mind, we don't really think that males are failures. Okay, this is just what we're counting. If, if they said the opposite, then males would be successes and females would be failure. Both are greater than 10. We therefore use the normal model for the sampling distribution. So if, yeah, if you don't know P, just think about the number of successes and the number of failures. You want the number of successes to be greater than or equal to 10, which it is, 72, and also the number of failures, quote unquote, I should say, it shouldn't really be failures, um, also greater than or equal to 10. That's if you don't know P, because like we said, you could, if you knew P, you can calculate NP, which we said has to be greater than or equal to 10, and N times 1 minus P, and that should be greater than or equal to 10. But in this module, we're assuming we don't know the P, we don't know P, we don't know the population proportion, so we can't really calculate that. So in this case, this is good enough to calculate or think about the number of successes, the number of failures, they both better be greater than or equal to 10. Okay, now we'll find the margin of error since we're free to go along and assume this is basically a normal model. We know that a sample proportion is only an estimate for the population proportion. We do not expect the sample proportion to equal the population proportion. So there's some error due to random chance because we might have, even though we picked a random sample of students, what was it, 135? It might have been that we happened to pick a sample that had more females proportionally than a, a different random sample or fewer females than it normally would be. We use the standard deviation of the sample proportion to describe the amount of error we can expect in random samples, and we call this standard error. Previously, we learned that the standard error of the sample proportion depends on the population proportion and sample size. Here's the formula for the standard error. I think we saw this before, yeah, standard error. Okay, when we use a normal model for the sampling distribution, 95% of sample proportions estimate the population proportion within approximately two standard errors. So the margin of error is the following, that's two standard errors, two times that formula with the square root. So now let's calculate the margin of error for the Tallahassee Community College estimate of, they estimated that 53.3% were female based on just that one sample. Notice that we have the sample, or sorry, we have the same problem we had earlier. We still don't know P, so how would I calculate this two standard errors formula if I don't know P, the population proportion? We can't calculate the margin of error, so our solution to this problem is to estimate the standard error using the sample proportion in place of P. Because we're assuming, well, I guess we have to assume because we don't know P, that P is approximately that population, or sorry, that sample proportion they gave us, 53.3. So even though it might, the, P, the actual P might not be that, we're assuming, okay, it's probably pretty close to this, hopefully, as long as this is a true random sample and we have enough students to get a, a good sample. For this example, the estimated standard error is, okay, let's kind of focus on that, maybe zoom in a little bit. So we are here. Let's see. So the estimated P, P is about 53 0.3%, but if we make that a decimal, that's 0.533. We're going to replace that in for P in the formula. It's P, so square root of P, which is 0.533 times 1 minus P, there it goes right there, over N. And remember they said we had 135 students, so N was 135. And we'll do that calculation. And if you round it, it ends up being something close to 0 0.043. So that's one standard error because we didn't put a two in front, but remember that our confidence interval we want would have two standard errors on either side. So we'll multiply what we got in that previous calculation by two. Two multiplied by that 0 0.043 is um, 0 0.086. So two standard errors, that's what we were interested in for our, our confidence interval is 0 0.086.
Okay, I think we can kind of zoom out now, just so we can see the whole thing again. Um, okay, now we can find the confidence interval. Now that we know what two standard errors is. Okay, we interpret the margin of error by saying that there are 95%, we are 95% confident that the proportion of all students at that college who are female is within point, that number we got before previously, 0 0.086 of our sample proportion, 0.533. We can then write the interval in the following form. We'll find the confidence interval this way. P hat plus or minus the margin of error, but the margin of error is that number we found. Margin of error is that 0 0.086 because the margin of error we said before is two standard, or two standard errors. Then we then add and subtract the margin of error from the sample pro proportion. The confidence interval is 0.447. So the 0.447 came from taking that sample proportion that we were given. They said 53.3% of college students are female, adding that, um, that number that we found up there, 0 0.086. Um, and we get this larger number. We also subtract it, 0. 533, because it's plus or minus, subtract 0 0.086, and we get this number. So that's somewhere in between there. We're 95% confident that somewhere between those two values, 0.447 and 0.619, we should have the actual population proportion. Yeah, we're estimating. Okay, so what's the conclusion? We, like we said, that's kind of, this is summarizing what we did. 95% confident that the proportion of all was it Tallahassee Community College students who are female is somewhere between those two values, 0.447 and 0.619, or in other words, 95% confident that between 44.7% of students are female, between 44.7% and 61.9%, so somewhere between those. We can also make this statement using percentages. Oh yeah, that's what we did. Between, yeah, <laughs> we just, I don't know why I jumped the gun on that one. Recall that 95% confidence means that this method captures the population proportion about 95% of the time, which is a pretty good, I guess that's pretty good. So, this, and so to, to summarize, conditions for using the normal model for the sampling distribution. Previously, we saw that a normal model describes the behavior of sample proportions. So we said before, if n times p is 10, greater than or equal to 10, and n times one minus p is greater than or equal to 10, we can use a normal model that was before in previous modules where we knew what n, or sorry, we knew what p was. Here we know n, but we don't necessarily know p. So for these formulas, these formulas say that the expected number of successes and failures in the sample must be 10 or greater. In actual statistical practice, we will never know the value of the population proportion. That's usually what you're trying to estimate, right? So you might not know it. So we estimate p with a sample proportion. Now we will assume that we can use a normal model if n multiplied by the sample proportion, so keep that in mind, p is the population proportion, regular p proportion. But on the other hand, if you have p hat, that's the sample proportion. So we're more be focusing on that in this module because we don't know necessarily the population proportion. Yeah, it would be nice. Statistics would be a lot easier if we always knew the, the population proportion, but usually you don't know that. If you're trying to infer something about a population, you don't know that, yeah, what's going on with that population. That's why you take a sample and pull, pull the sample. These formulas say that the actual number of successes and failures in the sample are 10 or greater. So we can use those same kind of conditions, n times p greater than or equal to 10, n times one minus p greater than or equal to, equal to 10, but we now have to say, okay, not really p, but p hat, the one that's just the sample proportion. The 95% confidence interval for estimating population proportion P. So previously we learned that the error in an estimate is related to the spread in the sampling distribution. We saw that the standard error of the sampling distribution of sample proportions is given by this formula. So we used that before. Now we are estimating the population proportion P. So we can't really use that formula. We don't know P. So we estimate the standard error by replacing P with the sample proportion. So now you can imagine that same exact formula, but with a p hat instead, p hat times instead of one minus p, one minus p hat again, all over n. We should know n because that's just the sample size, um, which affects the margin of error in the confidence interval. We have the following adjustment to, to the confidence interval formula where the sample proportion is p hat. So it looks the same as it did before. Your sample proportion, p hat, plus or minus two standard errors, which is that formula above with the square roots adjusted with the 
P hat instead of P 